listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McRoy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to discuss panic and the baptism of wisdom. Well, we're going to take a look tonight, once again, into a book titled Baphomet, The Temple Mystery Unveiled by Tracy R. Twyman and Alexander Rivera. And we're going to explore the connection between John the Baptist, whom we've discussed at length before here on this program, and the connection to the figure known as Baphomet. I believe the correct pronunciation is Baphomet, if you want to get technical about it, but I will say Baphomet because that's how it's spelled, and that's what it looks like, and that's what everybody's familiar with. So we'll use that term, but... uh, The whole point here is there are connections, deep-rooted, esoteric connections between these ideas and so many other things that just undergird our reality in a way that most people don't realize. And you can call this a touch of the synchro mystic. You can call it whatever you'd like. But you need to understand there are direct archetypes involved. And there are some very high-level occultists at the top of the power structure that understand many of these symbols and their usages and their effects on the human mind. And they've learned how to leverage these against people. And this is one of them. Now, these are some important ideas that we're going to discuss here tonight. We're going to put it all together, this connection between not only John the Baptist and the Baphomet figure, but also what the Baphomet figure represents, and that would be the inversion principle of the archetype known as Pan, the god of nature, back in the old Greek mythology. We're going to make those connections and many more here tonight. And in future episodes here, we're going to explore some other avenues of thought connected to this idea because this this whole thing, this symbol that's been adopted wholesale by the power structure, And make no doubt about it, they've adopted it, is this Baphomet figure. It's a symbol that's been adopted across the board by those dark occultists at the top. And it's been utilized in many different guises across the realms of the social engineering of this world, across media, across corporations. And we see it coming to bear in our reality around us. And it directly correlates to the push for the transhumanist notion that is coming. Not just coming, it's already here. It's already here. But let's get into it right now. We'll get right into the reading here, because there's a lot of ground to cover. And I don't want to people out there to miss the whole point here. So let's get into it. If the Gospel of John was actually written from John the Baptist's viewpoint, and if that viewpoint corresponds to Hermeticism, then we should not be surprised to discover that the Baptist and Hermes are symbolically linked to the same broader archetype of wisdom god, and also to each other specifically. Briefly, we mentioned before the figure of Oannes, the sage with a fish tail who came out of the sea each day to teach rude humanity the civilized ways. Interestingly, it seems that some comparative mythologists have connected this character to none other than John. We first became aware of this because of a throwaway line from Robert Graves who wrote in The White Goddess that, quote, Oddly enough, John the Baptist seems to have been identified by early Christian syncretists in Egypt with the Chaldean god Oannes, who, according to Barassus, under or used to appear at long intervals in the Persian Gulf, disguised as the merman Odakon, and renew his original revelation to the faithful. End quote. Searching for more information on the subject, we discovered what early 20th century Viennese writer and historian Richard Eisler wrote in Orpheus and the Fisher. They appear to imply that John was actually a reincarnation of Oannes, as the text states, quote, 
We should not hesitate even to presuppose that the same syncretism of John and Oannes, which seems so natural with Neo-Babylonian Gnostics, the Mandeans, existed also among the more immediate Jewish followers of the Baptist, seeing that influence of the Babylonian belief in ever new incarnations of the primeval Oannes, Barassus knows as many as six such reincarnations in past times, and Quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So you see, some of these, these researchers into some of these themes here, these mythological themes and these connections, have put together this connection between John the Baptist being a reincarnated figure of Oannes, this primeval god from the Babylonian times, the Babylonian Gnostics, and Gnosticism predates Christianity. Don't uh, make any mistake about that. Gnosticism is actually one of the things that undergirds a lot of our modern occultism. So this being the case, we have some of these scholars who looked into these various connections and made these assertions. So the assertion is made here that John the Baptist is a figure very much of the same ilk as this Oannes, this god Oannes of the Babylonians. So that being the case, it's the same archetype being portrayed here, and the connection could also be made back to Hermes, you see. And there's many more connections that we can see here. So this was as quoted from a book from this guy named Eisler, and it says another passage from the same book by Eisler says even more, and it says, quote, I am fairly convinced that the rapid propagation of John's idea and especially the spreading of his fame into the lowlands of South Babylonia, has indeed a good deal to do with the striking resemblance of his traditional name to that of the primeval Babylonian fish and fisher god, the teacher and lord of all wisdom, end quote. So I'm going to pause right there, so keep that in mind, the fisher, or the fisher god, and was not the promise of Jesus, I will make you fishers of men. You see, so uh, we see all these different connections that can be made on the archetypal level with this stuff. But let's continue reading and see what other bits of information we can pull out of this. And remember, remember, I always caution you, take this stuff with a grain of salt. There's really no way to prove nor disprove any of it. I just find it interesting that we have all these synchromistic tells out there these connections between these various ideas that transcend time and culture. And we have these archetypes that are ever-present in human thought. And these archetypes, whether you want to admit it or not, they do have a huge influence on the human psyche, whether you're aware of the origins of the archetype or not. It still affects you on an unconscious level. And when it affects you on the unconscious level, Eventually, it bridges that gap to manifestation in the conscious level through the bridge that is the subconscious, as we've discussed here in the past as well. But let's continue reading. It says, So we have an alleged etymological connection between Oannes and Ionis, John's original Greek name, as well as the association with fish and water symbolism that both figures have. John is associated with fish not only because of his baptisms in the river, but also because his namesake is the prophet Jonah. You will recall that this hero from the Old Testament spent three nights inside a sea creature, variously called either a fish or a whale, that Jewish legends and Kabbalists unanimously link to Leviathan. And I'm going to pause for a moment right there. Remember Leviathan. We discussed on some previous programs the idea of Leviathan and Behemoth, this connection, but going back to what's known as the left emanation, also known as the serpent seed in the Bible, the seed of the serpent. But uh, we don't want to revisit too much of that because that would be a very lengthy endeavor. So if you haven't listened to those programs, I would highly recommend you go back and give a listen, and then you'll have a better understanding of the comp comparison being made here. Leviathan, so the Kabbalists uni 
unanimously linked this idea of the fish or whale that swallowed Jonah in the tale to the concept of Leviathan, or the archetype that is known as Leviathan. Let's continue reading, though, because I don't want to get side-trailed there, because that could be uh, a whole other show in and of itself. But let's continue on. Another piece of evidence cited by Eisler to prove his point connecting John and Oannes was that the latter reportedly ate nothing when he was above the ocean's surface, giving mankind lessons in wisdom, just as the former reportedly ate nothing but locusts and wild honey. If we analyze John in what Robert Graves would call a mythopoic manner, we see that John's purported itinerant lifestyle, living in the wilderness, eating bugs, wearing a hair shirt, ranting and raving in public like a lunatic, connects him with the archetype of the wild man, discussed in the previous chapter, including the figures of Pan, Puck, Dionysus, Hermes, and the green man. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the Pan archetype, we see this connection between John, John the Baptist, and the Pan archetype, the wild man, living in the wilderness, eating bugs, wearing a hair shirt, ranting and raving in public like a lunatic. So there's the connection to the Pan archetype. So wisdom, Oannes, the Babylonian god of wisdom, connected to the idea of fish and the sea, and also the idea of Pan, the god of nature, the wild man, these two archetypes combine in the archetype of John the Baptist, connected to John the Baptist. Also, this connection back to Hermes. So these connections are all very meaningful on a lot of ways. And here's the thing. Sometimes it's hard for people to really understand the connotation, the subtle connotation involved in the intermingling of these symbols these symbolic representations of these characters. So it, it's not even a matter of if it's historical fact or not. What you need to understand is the archetype is in play in the stories that we have today of these figures. Do I think John the Baptist was a real historical figure? Yes, I have reason to believe that that is the case. But here's the important part. These archetypes are tied to the symbol that has risen from the calling back or the hearkening back to this, the figure himself, John the Baptist. So the symbolic representation here has taken on a life of its own. And this is what the primeval archetype idea is all about. So they've attached the archetype to the historical figure. So regardless of whether the historical figure literally existed or not is immaterial, the point of the matter is we have all of this connotation attached to the archetype, to the symbol that that figure has become now. And that's where the rubber meets the road with a lot of this stuff. So they've taken fig figures from the past predating John the Baptist and attached the ideas from those various figures to him. So you have the idea of Hermes attached to him. You have the idea of Pan attached to him. And we'll see how it all connects together with this Baphomet figure as we go, and how it's the inversion principle at play. Let's continue on. In the Catholic liturgical calendar, John's feast day falls on June 24th, also known as Midsummer's Day, or to modern neo-pagans, Litha, embracing an old Saxon term. This is most certainly a day in which the wild man is celebrated. Falling on or around the summer solstice, this is when the Green Man-related character known as the Oak King would be venerated in the British Isles before paganism was completely stamped out. It was Midsummer Night on which Shakespeare invoked Puck in his famous play Midsummer Night was also called the Honeymoon Night in Britain because it was considered the best time to harvest honey. Of course, honey is something we can connect with John. This connection was not missed by Tobias Churton in The Mystery of John the Baptist, where he wrote, quote, The solstice coincides with what used to be called the honeymoon, 
the origin of our costly nuptial abandon. A marble figure attributed to Leonardo's workshop, now in the Kaiser Friedrich Museum, Berlin, depicts a youthful John the Baptist gracefully gazing at a honeycomb held in his left hand, which is an allusion to John's wild honey diet. One wonders if this midsummer link to honey may have formed the traditional idea of masons as busy bees, end quote. And I'm going to pause for a second there to point out the fact that the bee is an esoteric symbol representing civilization, representing culture, representing the social strata, representing community or communitarianism, also known as communism, the bee, this symbol, also representing the Masons. And I find it very interesting that the biggest city that I live nearest to is named Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And on its town crest, on its flag, its insignia, is the beehive, a very Masonic town. We have a Masonic temple in Wilkesbury. And we also have the Irem Temple here as well within this area, the Irem Temple being the meeting place of the Shriner organization. So all these secret society groups have well interpenetrated various positions in society and they they usually have a lot to do with the foundation of cities and towns. The Masonic idea, the busy bees, the builders. You can see the symbology all throughout that, but that's that's a story for another day. But anyway, we can see the connection. John the Baptist ate wild honey and locusts as his diet. And, of course, the famous picture by Leonardo da Vinci of John pointing upwards with a, a coy smile on his face depicts this because he's holding a honeycomb in his one hand. I don't know if you could make it out on the thumbnail image of this episode, but that's what's represented in the picture. And he's pointing upward. Let's continue reading, though. Taking the iconotropy a step further, Churton connects the honey to Dionysus and thus Dionysus to John via Leonardo da Vinci, who painted and drew many images of John. After analyzing several of those, Churton writes this, quote, Underlying the ambiguous and arguably pagan inspiration of Leonardo's John is the existence of a similar work thought to have been painted between 1510 and 1515 by a follower of Leonardo from a drawing by the master. The painting has a dual identity. It is known both as St. John in the wilderness and as Bacchus, the god of religious ecstasy, wine, and intoxication, end quote. The painter chose to add vine leaves to the figure's head and leopard spots to John's hairy loincloth. A vine wreath added to the Baptist's former staff transformed it into a Bactic Thrysis, Dionysus' sacred staff borne by his wine-intoxicated followers. According to Euripides, the Thrysis dripped with honey. Going to pause for a moment there, folks, so we have this connection once again to Dionysus. So you see all the ways these different mythological figures are attached to some other figure, some other future figure, or a figure that postdates them. So now we have John the Baptist, who is a hugely important figure within Freemasonry as well as within the other occult fraternities. He's taken on the archetypes, the archetypal symbology of these other figures. So you see how it's drawn together an amalgamation of these different figures and put them all into one figure. And this one figure now has become a symbol representing all of these other earlier ideas. This is how the mystery schools often work. They will transfer the symbol or the archetype from one figure to another through the course of time. To bring the ideas forward through what's known as the underground stream 
of esoteric thought. And this is the Western influence, the Western stream of esoteric thought. There's also an Eastern stream, which relates more to the Oriental ideas, or the Eastern philosophies, the Buddhic principles. These things, they have their own set of symbols, but they all represent these same things. This is just the Western tradition that we have all of this. So these different archetypes are all inherent in this symbol that is known as John the Baptist now. And this is what's often referenced in many of the secret society groups. This is why they, they put reverence on this figure of John the Baptist. It represents so much more than just the biblical story. You see, there's layers upon layers of meaning attached to the symbol. That's where it all gets very interesting and sometimes murky for people looking from the outside. They don't understand exactly what's being represented. They may be familiar with the biblical story, but are they familiar with Greek mythology? Are they familiar with the other mythologies? Babylonian mythology? Some of these other ideas? Are they familiar with Hermetic thought? Oftentimes not, so they don't recognize what the underlying meaning is of the symbol. And although they don't recognize it on a conscious level, their unconscious mind recognizes the archetype that's presented, and that will affect the human psyche in ways that we don't quite understand on a conscious level, but it will affect us, and the occultists understand better how these things can affect the human psyche in subjective ways. And therefore, they seek to leverage these principles against mankind, against the masses, or the profane, as they call them, because they know you don't understand, and that's partly... Mostly, I should say, because they've kept some of this wisdom hidden from us from time immemorial. They use secrecy as a weapon against people. So very largely, they've actually weaponized the idea of secret knowledge against people in this way by keeping from the masses some of the attachments here to the symbol and if they understand that, and you don't, that gives them a distinct advantage over you. And it's all about maintaining power in this place, power over others. That's what many of these dark occultists that run things in this world seek. They want power over others. They want to have power over everything. And by keeping this secret from you, they have power over you. So if they understand a symbol that you don't and can learn to leverage that in some way against you in a way that you won't be able to recognize and influence you in a way you don't recognize, that gives them so much power over you. And sadly, that's where we are in this world. They leverage these things against us all the time because it is archetypal. And that's the whole point. It's archetypal. Your unconscious mind will recognize the symbol. And through the recognition of the symbol, these people can implant some subtle type of ideas along with the use of the symbol and influence your behavior. And you don't even know what's going on. And that's what's been done. And that's the level of how corrupt things have gotten in this world. That's the level of control that these people have, of influence. Anyway, let's continue reading. I don't want to get too hung up on my little soapbox rantings here. Although it may seem strange to connect a prophet known for abstaining from wine with the very god of the vine himself, Churton is definitely on to something. He also talks about John's role here as one incarnating the divine Hermes, the psychopomp leading the soul upward through the waters to a higher life. Churton suggests that the baptism in the gospel might actually be secretly hinted at as having taken place in the underworld with the River Jordan, symbolically representing the rivers of Hades that one must travel to get from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead. He writes, quote, Symbolically, the ferryman, 
may then be seen as John Hermes. Hermes, remember, was seen in Hellenistic tradition as a psychopomp, literally a guide of souls through the darkness of death to the other side, the herald of another world attainable only through death. As Churton points out, many others have connected the figure of John to that of Hermes before. Quote, Less than a decade before Leonardo painted his late masterpiece, German artist Conrad Celtes produced a woodcut wherein the Greek god Hermes appeared as a straight stand-in for John the Baptist. Celtes simply hooked into the idea of Hermes as the divine messenger and made the identification of John Hermes by reference to the understanding of John the Baptist as revered forerunner or herald of Christ, the one crying in the wilderness. End quote. The most famous statue of Hermes by Giovanni de Bologna, which, according to Edith Hamilton, is what makes him the most recognizable Greek god to modern people, shows him pointing a finger up to the sky in the same manner that John the Baptist is often shown doing, particularly in Renaissance art. However, he has several times also been depicting with his other hand pointing downward towards the earth, just like a Lifus Levi's depiction of Baphomet, doing what we call the as above, so below pose. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. As above, so below. The hermetic idea associated with John the Baptist, also associated more largely in the modern era with the figure known as Baphomet. As above, so below. The Hermetic Thought, and have we not seen this before? Have we not noticed the connections before? Let's read on here. The reason why St. John's Day is near the summer solstice is because Luke one thirty six tells us that Mary's cousin Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with John when Mary conceived Jesus. Since Jesus was born on Christmas, ostensibly, near the winter solstice, putting John's birthday on midsummer night just made sense. In Freemasonry, both John the Baptist and John the Evangelist are considered their two main patron saints. The Evangelist's feast day is on December 27th, while the Baptist, as we know, is on June 24th. It has been quite common historically for Masonic lodges to have mandatory meetings scheduled twice a year on the feast days of the two Johns. During Masonic initiations, an il illustration is used called the Masonic Point Within a Circle. It shows the two Johns standing astride a circle with a dot in the middle, possibly representing the orbit of the earth around the sun, with the solstices represented visually with pictures of the two Johns on either end. In this Masonic icon, the Baptist is always shown in the Baphometic as above, so below pose described above, wearing his hair shirt. Going to pause for a moment, folks. The hair shirt, the shirt made of hair, hearkening back to the idea of pan, once again. So we see here, this is an important icon in Freemasonry. John the Baptist and, of course, John the Evangelist, and they are oftentimes considered to be one and the same figure symbolically to the Masons. Two different aspects to the same figure, the same archetype. The heads and the tails of the coin, if you will. Let's read on here. John the Baptist's feast day is on his birthday which is unusual for a Christian saint since they are usually honored on the anniversary of their martyrdom, and John's story ended just as badly as those of other saints. But there is a date fixed for that event, which happens to be August 29th. Tobias Churton points out that this co coincides with the time of wheat and barley harvest in the Western world. This would have been around the time that the traditional English folk song, John Barleycorn, famously performed by the band Traffic on their fourth album, John Barleycorn Must Die, would have been sung. This creepy tune talks about killing and dismembering the title character in a seemingly sacrificial manner that appears to be connected to harvest rituals, and he may have been named John with the beheaded Baptist in mind. 
the connection seems close enough for Churton to definitively write, quote, The beheading of John became linked to a profound archetype, rooted in ancient conceptions of the head of wheat and barley corn being severed to fulfill the promise of life and abundance for the people, end quote. Interestingly, the time in which churches celebrate the baptism of the Lord, January 19th for the Orthodox, and the first Sunday following, get this, January 6th for Catholics, going to pause for a moment here, folks, January 6th, the Epiphany, the date of the Epiphany, also hearkening back to the older tradition of the Feast of Fools, The Feast of Fools, I've done some shows talking about this before, and how the January 6th debacle that happened, that is our modern-day political theater, is nothing but a hearkening back to these archetypes, folks. Hearkening back to these archetypes. But anyway, let's continue on. So, let me start that sentence again. Interestingly, the time in which churches celebrate the baptism of the Lord, which is January 19th for the Orthodox, and the first Sunday following January 6th for the Catholics, is close to the time, which it says in parentheses, January 20th, when the sun enters the house of Aquarius, the water bearer. There is yet another pagan wild man entity that Churton saw fit to connect with John the Baptist. The aforementioned Pan. Gonna pause for a moment right here, folks. This is important. There's a definite connection there. And we'll see how it ties to this Baphomet figure again as we continue on. To hear him tell it, the waters of the sacred Jordan may have actually been the waters of Pan. He mentions that there was a sanctuary and sacred spring dedicated to Pan called Paneus, issuing from none other than Mount Hermon, where the watchers landed on earth from heaven, according to the first book of Enoch. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, the start of the Genesis chapter 6 experiment, as it's come to be known by many researchers, where the watchers, these fallen angels descended from heaven on Mount Hermon. They came up with their plan. I think there was 200 in number initially. And their plan was to mate with the daughters of men because they found them to be fair. And from such, the offspring produced were what are referred to in the Bible as the Nephilim, also referred to in many translations as giants. There were giants in the earth in those days and afterwards. Giants, unnatural beings that don't belong in this natural world. This was an incursion, an incursion of something synthetic that doesn't belong in the natural world. And this, according to many Christian theologians and many different scholars of other types of studies, would be the reasoning for the Great Flood. This is what's been speculated and talked about by many. Can we absolutely prove any of these things? Well, certainly not. But they are very much entrenched in our modern society, in our modern culture, in the religious ideologies and the mythological ideologies that we're familiar with. These archetypes... So you see, so we have now this connection to Pan, and there was a spring there dedicated to Pan called Paneus, and it issued forth from Mount Hermon. And there we have a connection to the the Watchers, the Fallen Angels, as they were called in the Book of Enoch, the Watchers. So let's continue. He says, it may have been the source of the river that John used to baptize people. We must presume that John the Baptist would have come to Paneus also. How could he not? For in his day a giant spring used to gush from a limestone cave, whence the waters wove their way down to Hula marshes, thence southward. According to Josephus, 
This mighty spring was held to be the source of nothing less than the living waters of the holy river Jordan. Now the fountains of Jordan rise at the roots of this cavity outwardly, and as some think, this is the utmost origin of Jordan. So by linking John to this half-goat fertility god, Churton presents what can obviously be construed as yet another symbolic link between the Baptist and the idea of Baphomet. The other obvious link, besides the fact that the Templars revered him, is that his head was severed, and the Baphomet idols purportedly used by the Templars took the form of a severed head or skull. The idea that the Baphomet head might have been John's is written about in almost every nonfiction book ever penned about this dark chapter in the Templars' history, and I'm going to pause for a moment right there, folks. Absolutely. This is the conclusion that was reached by many who have looked into the Templars. This is what they thought, that this skull, this severed head that the Templars allegedly called Baphomet and drank from and did many rituals with may have represented the severed head of John the Baptist. And you could make the connections. You could see, I mean, it would be logical that this quasi-Christian organization, the Templars, might utilize some type of a symbol like that in their rituals. You can understand maybe the connection here. And that is, of course, the first time that the idea of Baphomet is presented to mankind is with the Templars. There is no earlier mention of a figure known as Baphomet than the Templars. This is the origin point. This is where the crossover happened. This is where the inversion principle was put into play. The inversion of Pan, the connection to the archetype with John the Baptist, with Hermes, with all of these different figures together here. They took all of these positive notions and inverted them. And what do I mean by the inversion principle of Pan? Well, Pan... Pan was half goat, half man, but his lower half was goat and his upper half was man. He had the face and head of a man with horns. The Baphomet figure has the head of a goat. Have you noticed that? It's the inverse principle. The inverse principle represented in the very figure itself, in the art itself. The idea began with the Templars, and of course, Eliphas Levi made it famous, the representation we see today, the goat-headed figure known as Baphomet today. So it took some time for it to manifest and make the, the crossover here, the inversion principle through time. Let's continue reading, though, and we'll put together some other connections. We'll connect some dots John's connection with Freemasonry is interesting. Of course, it is assumed to have been absorbed from the Templars. Tobias Churton points out that before the Grand Lodge of London completely took over and homogenized the craft in the 18th century, there was a time during which the members of lodges who had not yet been incorporated were known cryptically as St. John's Men. It was clear at the time that the St. John they were referring to was the Baptist. However, after the Grand Lodge takeover, Churton notes that the Masons began celebrating John the Evangelist as well, and he seems to think they did this to muddy the waters and make it hard to tell which John was really special to them. He quotes from the famous Sloan Manuscript, a 15th century collection of texts on file in the British Museum, which contains a script for a Masonic ritual in which the candidate must state the first Masonic word, was given at the Tower of Babylon, and that the first Masonic Lodge, back then, was called the Chapel of St. John. So here we have John and the origins of Freemasonry connected to the Babylonians and perhaps an echo of their priesthood's initiation into the rites of Oannes, the memory of which may have been later transposed onto the figure of the Baptist. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So once again, 
The taking of the old figure, the transference of the archetypal nature of the old figure to the new one, a new representation of an older archetype. We have this transference that goes on, and they still do it today. We have other symbols or archetypes today that have been given their meanings from older ideas, the transference of various archetypes. And we have these in our modern works of fiction, things like Star Wars and our modern mythologies. They've taken some of these older things and they've transferred them to some symbol that we would recognize in our modern era. And when they have the same underlying archetypal meanings and attached to them as a symbol and they take on the mantle of these older figures they still do this today with many things look at the figure of darth vader the dark father the dark father it's a very very old archetype not going to go into that one here tonight but <laughs> you could Use your imagination and start making some connections from Darth Vader as a figure to some other mythological figures of the past and understand maybe some of the Saturnian influence that was given to the character of Darth Vader. But I digress on that. Let's continue reading here. This brings us to the next noteworthy quotation from The Cauldron and the Grail, Ritual Astronomy and the Quest for Enlightenment by Hank Harrison. Here he talks about the Greek rites of Eleusis, an offshoot of the Dionysian cult, and how they would drink hallucinogenic intoxicants proffered to them by Pluto, the lord of the underworld who would then transform into a man-fish like Oannes and reveal to them secret, sacred wisdom. And this is from that book, quote, In the rituals of Eleusis, as enacted at the height of Athenian power in the Greek Golden Age, it was crucial that Pluto entice Persephone in her human form into a state of expanded consciousness. She must see more in order to understand the mystery. To do this, Pluto has her drink a psychotropic substance from a special goblet, the Kykion, another proto-grail, Pluto then transforms himself into Lakchos, an anthropomorphic manfish who performs a passion play based on ritual astronomy. This is not a strictly Atlantic ritual. Clearly, the manfish can be traced to Vishnu and the Vedic scriptures, but the Atlantic contribution is also apparent, especially in the transformation process and in the fact that the audience becomes an intrinsic part of the mystery. At Eleusis, the spectators sing hymns to the manfish, a figure who shows up 1,500 years later in the Grail literature as the Fisher King. Only Iacos can return the maiden, Persephone, essentially the vessel of the Grail, to the world of light, and only the Fisher King can reveal the Grail secrets to Percival and we have another connection here to the man-fish, the fish-man, Oannes, the fisher-king, the Eleusian mysteries, the wisdom, the fisher-king, he can reveal the secrets of the grail, the grail secrets, the, the secret wisdom. Let's continue on, and we'll make some more connections here. Of course, Oannes is linked to John, as we have established, and Iacos brings to mind Jack, a common nickname for men named John, as well as Bacchus, the Roman term for Dionysus. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Iacos, Jack, Bacchus, John, What's all this mean? What's the connection? What are some of the connections here? Jack. The Black Jack. 21. 2001. 
perhaps we'll have to do another episode talking about the idea of the blackjack. I'll refer to Michael Hoffman's work for that. The idea of the blackjack. And we see that here also associated now with John the Baptist and therefore to the symbol also known as Baphomet, the blackjack. So many of these ideas are interconnected. Interconnected in many ways that most people don't even understand. But I assure you there are dark occultists in places of power in this world that very much understand these connections and these connotations and the archetypes they represent. And they leverage them all the time. In past programs here, I've associated the idea of the blackjack having related to the clown idea, and how we have been now initiated into clown world through the whole January 6th debacle. All these ideas are inherent there, and we see it attached to this figure, this inversion principle of Pan, the Baphomet archetype, that's been adopted in the modern era as the symbol, the new symbol, for the new god of this era, and the new god of this era, of course, is science. Science. And that's why you see this inversion principle being used everywhere. The artificial. But let's continue reading, because there's a lot more to get through here. And I don't want to get hung up on side trails that much. Let me begin that again. Of course, Oannes is linked to John, as we have established, and Iakos brings to mind Jack, a common nickname for men named John, as well as Bacchus, the Roman term for Dionysus. In some versions of the above-mentioned rite, it is Dionysus himself who is transformed into Iakos or Iacus. Drinking the wine of Dionysus could very well be symbolic of drinking divine wisdom. As we saw with Marcus the Magician and his version of the Eucharistic cup, the Mandians venerated John the Baptist as a Gnostic figure who dipped others in water, immersing them in a flood of Gnosis. Simon Magus presumably taught the same thing to his disciples. What John was teaching was that salvation through Gnosis, represented by the Logos, or by Christ to the Christians, is readily available to those who seek the hidden wisdom of the Nazarenes, a term even the Mandians used to refer to their priests. For the Templars, however, it seems likely that the secret knowledge they sought was symbolized by their idol Baphomet, and conferred on, upon their initiates via the baptism of wisdom rite which they may or may not have believed to have had anything to do with John's baptism. As we will see, this rite was perhaps more blasphemous and scandalous than most people could even ima imagine. And I'm going to pause for a second here, folks, to point out that this is what a lot of these secret society groups teach, that the whole idea that Jesus the Christ, as they call him, represents the idea of the Logos, or Gnosis. Gnosis. The divine wisdom being baptized into the divine wisdom. This is the notion, the baptism of wisdom rite, talked about here by the Templars, and how it associates to this Baphomet figure. John the Baptist, the baptism, baptism of wisdom. You see the connections back to some of these old archetypes. Let's continue on because there's some more here to cover. And we'll try to connect a few more dots here before we sign off. Maybe leave you with a little something to think about. Quote, the ancient mysteries later fell into a perverted decline and were replaced with ceremonial sorcery, incantations in lieu of divine magic, 
and also were filled with the indescribable practices of the orgies of Bacchus. The keys to esoteric knowledge were thrown over the hedge of time, end quote. And that's a quote from Henry C. Clausen, former sovereign grand commander of the Supreme Council of the Southern Jurisdiction of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the USA. That's an interesting statement, isn't it, folks? An absolutely true statement. They did. The ancient mysteries fell into a perverted decline, which is still going on today. Way beyond a decline, it's an inversion process, and it's being purposely done by those at the top of the power structure, those dark occultists at the very tippy top of the power structure who run things in this world, who have decided to keep certain knowledges and wisdoms from the various people groups of this world for themselves so that they could control people. And through time, many of these ideas have become so perverted that though these things that are taught as true wisdom are actually the antithesis of true wisdom and are working against nature. They're not the real deal. They're not the original teachings. They're the total inversion of the original teachings. And they've taught people this in the modern era, in modern occultism, as being the real thing. And only they are smart enough and wise enough to be able to see it. And it's all perverse. It's all perversion. But let's continue reading here, and we'll see if we can make a little more sense out of it for you. If John is connected to the cults of Dionysus and Pan, then we should not be surprised to find out that those who practice similar Gnostic baptismal religions at later times also indulged in ceremonies involving intoxication, frenzy, ecstasy, and sexual license. In Hippolytus' refutation of all heresies, there is evidence that the Nicaeans may have performed homosexual acts in their rituals. If this is true, then it may be that they believed their sexual practice was somehow reversing the normal course of sex and turning the energy backwards, turning the Jordan River in a different direction as the Mandeans may have allegorized, and thereby restoring themselves to divinity. Similarly, practitioners of tantric sexual yoga withhold from ejaculating in order to retain the sexual energy within for alleged spiritual gains. Perhaps in the Nicaeans or similar groups, we can see or we can find the origins of the Templar's supposed homosexual initiation rituals. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now, if you're able to read between the lines, now you may understand why these dark occultists who run things seek to invert the natural order, the natural process of things, why they seek total inversion of nature, the total inversion of the natural world into something wholly synthetic or artificial. It is for this reason. Let me read that again in the context of these rituals. And then you'll see In Hippolytus' refutation of all heresies, there is evidence that the Nicaeans may have performed homosexual acts in their rituals. If this is true, then it may be that they believed their sexual practice was somehow reversing the normal course of sex and turning the energy backwards, turning the Jordan River in a different direction, as the Mandeans may have allegorized, and thereby restoring themselves to divinity... So I'm going to pause there just to point out, have you ever wondered why they seek to invert everything? Why they call good evil and evil good? Why they push and promote the sexual confusion in this era? The normal course of sex, as referred to here, reversing the normal course of sex. Well, it's the inversion principle. And it's because they believe that by doing this, they can somehow restore themselves to divinity. It's all about power, folks. It's all about becoming the gods of this place. 
like I've been telling you for the longest time. There it is. This is why they do the things they do. It's one thing for me to tell you and demonstrate to you that they seek to invert the natural order. Then that brings up the question, well, why would they do that? And this is their reason why. They think by doing so they will become God. That is why. They think they, they could somehow restore themselves back to some type of spiritual authority in this way. It's akin to spitting in the face of the Creator, saying we can do better through inverting the natural order of things. This is what it's all about. And this is also what is probably at the, the core to the Templar initiation right here, that they say they have these homosexual initiation rituals. This probably has to do with it too. And the introduction of the Baphomet idea, the inversion principle of the natural order, Pan being the god representing nature, the natural order, Baphomet representing the new world order, the inversion of Pan, are you beginning to understand? Have we connected the dots well enough for you here? Let's read on here. It says, Hippolytus tells us of the Nicaeans while quoting from Scripture. And, quote, he quotes from Romans 127, quote, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. Now the expression that which is unseemly signifies, according to these, the first and blessed substance, figureless, the cause of all figures to those that are molded into shapes, end quote. And it goes on to state, quote, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet, end quote. And that's from Romans one twenty seven. For in these words which Paul has spoken, they say the entire secret of theirs and a hidden mystery of blessed pleasure and com are comprised. For the promise of washing is not any other, according to them, then the introduction of him that is washed in, according to them, life-giving water and anointed with ineffable ointment, then his introduction into unfading bliss, end quote. Now that was a quote from Hippolytus talking about the Nicaeans and quoting from scripture to make his point here about the inversion process and how they thought that in this way in this way they could become more godlike they could be washed in the living water let's read on this entire section indicates that the nicaeans believed that paul secretly taught them to practice homosexual rites we suspect that the terms washing and life-giving water and ineffable ointment mentioned above all refer to a ritual bathing in semen. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. And did you ever wonder why these people in positions of power in this world are such pervs? Well, this is exactly why. It all has to do with this. The whole notion of the elixir of life and everything else associated with this. All these different ideas. So this is what many of these dark occultists at the top of the power structure believe and act upon. And many of their underlings who think they're oh so enlightened and illumined. These are the things that they believe and practice. And it's all about the inversion of the natural order of things. And they think it could buy them immortality and godhood apotheosis let's go ahead and read on judging from epiphanius's explicit accounts of gnostics eating semen and menses as the eucharist as well as consuming aborted embryos pounded with honey and pepper it doesn't seem too far-fetched a lot of epiphanius's criticism against gnostic groups is based on his interpretation of a metaphor of gathering up the spiritual seeds of the world for the Gnostic Church. 
These are the spiritual elect. The Greek word for seed is sperma. Here is an example of the metaphor being used in the Gospel of Eve that was twisted by Epiphanius in Panarean 26.3.1. Quote, I stood upon a lofty mountain and saw a man who was tall and another little of stature. And I heard, as it were, the sound of thunder and drew nigh to hear. And he spake with me and said, I am thou and thou art I. And wheresoever thou art, there am I. And I am sown in all things, and from wherever thou wilt thou gatherest me. But in gathering me thou gatherest thyself. End quote. And then the Gospel of Philip, a Gnostic Gospel, not part of the Nag Hammadi Codices, tells us something similar as well. Quote, the Lord hath shown me what my soul must say on its ascent to heaven, and how it must answer each of the powers on high. I have recognized myself, it saith, and gathered myself from every quarter, and have sown no children for the archon. But I have pulled up his roots, and gathered my scattered members, and I know who thou art, for I, it saith, am of the ones on high. End quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now it's important for me to point out the Gnostic roots of this, the Gospel of Philip. Speaking of, he has so no children for the archon. The archons, another Gnostic idea, and the demiurge, these Gnostic ideas that kind of undergird a lot of, much of the modern ways of thinking, whether people realize it or not. The secular ways of thinking, a lot of this Gnostic interpretation of things undergirds much of that. And that's an interesting connection to make, too. But uh, we're not going to touch too much upon that tonight. Let's just leave that there for now, because I still want to cover quite a bit before we sign off here. Let's continue with our reading here. All of this is consistent with the idea that some Gnostic sects believed they were gathering spiritual seeds from the world and returning them to the realm above. It seems to have something to do with refraining from conceiving children, while at the same time not refraining from sex, quite the opposite. Simon Megas is also said to teach the same libertine practices, calling it, quote-unquote, perfect love. And I'm going to pause right there for a moment, folks. So, let's think about this logically. Refraining from conceiving children, while at the same time not refraining from sex, but rather the opposite, indulging in it with whomever and whatever. These are modern ideas we see promoted in our culture, don't we? Do you ever wonder where that comes from? Well, certainly it comes from many of these Gnostic ideas and from this inversion principle that the power structure has wholesale adopted here in our modern world. The whole power structure has adopted this ideology, this archetype that we would call Baphomet. The inversion principle of the natural order of things it's got deep roots, ladies and gentlemen. goes way, way back. But we're seeing it manifest here in a way never quite paralleled before in the history of mankind, at least the recorded history of mankind that we're aware of. We're living in epic times, folks. Get your heart right with God. Get your relationship right with God. We're living in very strange days indeed. The best thing you could do is... Cling on to the spiritual. Be in right relation with God, the Creator. And hold tight to that. That is how we get out of some of the things that are coming. That is how we craft a better future for ourselves. By not losing touch with the real deal. The natural order of things. The natural world. And, of course, our relationship with God the Creator. We need that. We have these spiritual roots. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience here, not the other way around, as these 
these dark cultists who thrive on the inversion ideas would have you believe. They would have you believe you're a physical being having a mock spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. That's the fact of the matter. Let's continue reading. It might be wise to consider that Epiphanius was perhaps just misinterpreting a mystical teaching and indulging in gossip about the same rumors that were once heard in the Roman Empire about Christians. We saw how Celsus conflated the Christians with the Ophites, Ophites, excuse me, with each other, accusing the Christians of being involved in the Ophites' secret orgies and cannibalistic rites. However, it is undeniable that the authors of the early Gnostic scripture were practically obsessed with erotic symbolism. In Refutations 521, Hippolytus referred to the phallic deity Priapus, who the Gnostic teacher Justin claimed had, quote, fashioned all things, end quote. Epiphanius in Panarinian 2524 also connected the teaching of the libertine Nicolaitans who the revelation of St. John condemns in the strongest terms, together with a great female power called Barbello, who emitted from the Father, her relation to the world-creating powers, or archons, is highly erotic because she, quote, continually appears to the archons in some beautiful form and through their climax and ejaculation takes their seed to recover her power which has been sown in several of them, end quote. This continued emitting of semen is an important part of the recovery of a female force. Situated in the eighth heaven, Nicholas is quoted as saying, quote, unless one copulates every day, he cannot have eternal life, end quote. And that's from Pan-Iranian 25.15. We must look to the observations of Jacques Le Carrier, on all of this, when we, he connects Gnostic sex rituals, as reported by the Church Fathers, with Satanic Black Mass in his book, The Gnostics. And he says here, quote, The Black Mass is not far removed from the Barbello Gnostic ritual, certainly no farther than Sabaoth is from Lucifer, and it is no more chance that certain aspects of these rites are to be found right down to the present day among the Luciferian sects, where they are spiced with Kabbalistic demonology, the ambivalence of the whole Gnostic attitude, the perpetual temptation that oscillates between rigorous asceticism and rigorous debauch, since both have the same soteriological value, is to be found there, and, in the historical evolution of Gnosticism, was translated into the opposing paths of mystic Catharism, far the first, and magic Luciferianism, or Luciferism, for the second, end quote. So, I'm going to pause there and point out the fact that they always, always give you these polarizing ideas, these polaristic ideas associated with these things. You see, there's the left path and the right path. That's what all of these different teachings have in common. Now, the Kabbalists may call it something slightly different than the Gnostics and vice versa, but, but it's all the same ideas going back for as long as we could look. It's all about this inversion principle. So we see the modern roots of what we would call Satanism today. Go back to Gnostic teachings. Gnostic teachings. It's amazing how all these things interconnect, isn't it? Let's read on here. In Roman history, the Roman historian Livy makes the same accusations against those who partook in the Bacchanalia ceremonies when he writes, quote, When once the mysteries had assumed this promiscuous character and men were mingled with women with all the license of nocturnal orgies, there was no crime, no deed of shame or wanting. More uncleanness was wrought by men with men than with women. Whoever would not submit to defilement or shrank from violating others was sacrificed as a victim. 
To regard nothing as impious or criminal was the very sum of their religion, end quote. These Bacchic, Bacchus worshippers were pretty hardcore. Even more amazing, there is evidence that there was a strong Bacchic Dionysian influence on Christianity as well as the Johannite heresy. As we mentioned when we first encountered John in the Gospels, especially in Matthew, we find that John described as a homeless madman living on insects. He seems to be demonstrating the sort of mania etymologically related to manteia, meaning prophecy, described by Plato in Phaedrus 244 DE, where he says, quote, This madness can provide relief from the greatest plagues of trouble that beset certain families because of their guilt for ancient crimes. It turns up among those who need a way out. It gives prophecies and takes refuge in prayers to the gods and in worship, discovering mystic rites and purifications that bring the man it touches through to safety for this and all time to come. So it is that the right sort of madness finds relief from present hardships for a man it has possessed. End quote. Baptism was one of the sacraments of the Thracian moon and fertility goddess Cotis, Ian C. Story writes in Eupolis, poet of old comedy, quote, Baptei were worshippers, in this case, of the goddess Kaitito, Ky- who had undergone a ritual immersion or washing as a rite of initiation, end quote. We also find much Dionysian symbolism in the Gospel of John as well. Some of it is discussed in the previous chapter, it says here in the parentheses. In John 2, 1 through 11, we see Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana, once celebrated by the Catholic Church on the same feast day as Jesus' baptism. That would be January 6th, folks. The epiphany date, hearkening back to an older ritual known as the Feast of Fools. January 6th, there's an importance to that date. And like I have told you before, there's so much of this underlies everything in this world, all these occult symbols and occult archetypes and dates and times that they plan things. They all have hidden meanings, folks. Let's continue reading here, though. Similarly, there were many myths of Dionysus' miracle production of wine. The Middle Platonist and historian Plutarch relayed this wine miracle in The Life of Lysander, where he says that the handmaidens and nurses of the infant Dionysus dipped him into a spring and the water changed into wine of a pleasant taste. For a polytheistic Greek audience, the Dionysian resonance in the story of Jesus' wine miracle would have been unmistakable. Moreover, John's Gospel employs further Dionysian imagery when Jesus is quoted as saying, quote, I am the true vine, end quote. John's Jesus presents himself as a new Dionysus, superior to the previous version of the God. 1 Corinthians 12, 12-13, we read, quote, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit, end quote. To drink of one spirit parallels the Dionysian ritual of imbibing the god through consumption of wine. The word spirit is even a term applied to alcoholic beverages. This is the basis of the Catholic Eucharist, with the consumption of Jesus Christ's blood symbolized as wine and his flesh as the water of or as the wafer of bread. So I'm gonna pause right there and say we see these connections, of course. And remember, you do have to take this stuff with a grain of salt, as I always caution you. Because there's no way to prove the correctness of this or the incorrectness of it. This is what's presented by the Gnostics. These are their teachings. This is what heavily influences many people in the occult fraternities today. The secret society groups. And many of these people have risen to positions of power or prominence in this world. And the things they do, acting upon these things they believe, or think they know that we don't, the things they do 
to act upon their beliefs here will affect all of us in some way or another. So even if you think it's total nonsense, understand there's people in positions of power in this world that very much believe in these things and act upon them. And it will affect you on some level. So you need to understand why they do the things they do, how they do the things they do, and what exactly they're looking for as an end result thereof. That's why we explore these ideas here. These are the things they teach within the highest, most levels of these secret occult fraternities They teach that they are the true vine. You see, going back to some of these ideas again. And that it is their divine purpose to become the gods of this place. And they hearken back to these old archetypes. And they leverage them against the human mind in ways most of, most of us can't fathom because we're not familiar with the mythologies like we once were. We don't get that classic education anymore. We don't recognize the symbol consciously, but it still affects our unconscious mind. And these people understand that, and they use it against us. And a prime example of this is something as simple or as simple as a logo, a corporate logo. It affects your mind in a way that you don't even realize. And that's the whole point. That's why they do this. That's why they do this stuff. But let's go ahead. Let's continue. We're going to close it out here. So we'll read on. It says, The Bacchic possession of divine madness has parallels with Paul's teaching on how possession of the Holy Spirit was meant to affect a convert who received it through baptism, resulting in things like glossolalia, speaking in tongues. The Greek word entheos, meaning within is a god, was used to describe someone that is divinely possessed. This is the origin of the word enthusiasm. This is the state of ecstasis, or ecstasy, as the divine term, or the, the modern term has now become ecstasy. When the boundaries between the egoic self, other people, and the God worshipped are dissolved into an experience of rapture and unity. The ecstasy of God's presence was said to be induced by music, dance, wine, and omophagia, the eating of raw flesh. Similarly, in John 6, 53-56, Jesus said to his disciples, quote, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. End quote. Jesus implored his followers to consume his divine flesh and blood to regenerate their souls from their fallen state, decaying in meat sacks because of their progenitor's exile from Eden after the consumption of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. This can be compared to ambrosia, the food of the gods on Olympus, which gave their blood, called ichor, the power to keep them immortal. Not, too, that the fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden had such properties, as do the rivers of the water of life that are said to flow through the new Jerusalem for the saved ones at the end times. As we mentioned, these rivers are described as ultimately issuing from the sliced open jugular vein of the Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God, depicted as standing on the altar at the center of the holy city. Clearly, the latter description is a metaphor for the blood of Christ. Semen and blood were both substances considered by all ancient societies to be the givers of life and the carriers of soul essence. Especially included here was menstrual blood, which many ancient cultures thought was a coagulant from which the body of a fetus was formed, possessing the germ of life in itself, not understanding the role played by the ovum 
Under a more hermetic or Gnostic lens, one can interpret ingesting these holy foods as medicine to transcend one's fate controlled by the fixed stars of the Zodiac. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. And I will disagree with this assessment that the earlier cultures didn't understand that the menstrual blood itself was not playing a role. That the menstrual blood played the role of the ovum here. Oh, I will, <laughs> I will disagree with that statement. I don't think ancient man was as dumb as we make him out to be. There's something more associated with the idea of menstrual blood. But this is what the common teaching through the occult fraternities is about that view. And this is why you have such things going on in the modern era as what's known as spirit cooking. If you remember seeing about that a few years back, how John Podesta had these big celebrations with this artist, uh, what's her name, Marina Abramovich or something like that, where she came and put on this display using menstrual blood and spirit cooking ceremonies and rituals and things like that going on where they ingest this stuff. This stuff was going on way back when in many of these old occult settings as well within these different groups. Let's read on and we're going to wrap it up. This is the key to understanding the elixir of life spoken of by the alchemists, which Ignatius of Antioch equated with the Eucharist. He called it the medicine of immortality. In Ignatius to the Ephesians 20-2, in modern times the self-purported Neo-Templar, the Ordo Templi Orientis, serve as their Gnostic, as their Gnostic mass what they call Cake of light, a mix of menstrual blood, semen, honey, cake batter, and olive oil. <laughs> Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. This is exactly what I was just speaking of, this spirit cooking idea. It's not just something that has to do with artists and stuff like that, like the mainstream politicians and stuff would have you believe. It's actually a ritual of the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO, part of their Gnostic Mass where they make these cakes of light instead of the traditional Eucharist wafer. Let's read on. It says, We are not quite sure how many of the participants are aware of the ingredients of the cakes as these rites are open to the public and no warning is given to congregants about what they are about to consume. Isn't that nice? In Liber Aleph, Aleister Crowley writes the preeminent, In all sex magic, quote, is the formula of the serpent with the head of the lion, end quote, which he says is a reference to semen and another personification of Baphomet, quote, and all this magic is wrought by the radiance and creative force thereof, end quote. To Crowley, the personal will and magical prowess was symbolized by the erect phallus. The woman is a necessary, respected, and consecrated essential of the formula for sex magic, but only in a reflective sense as a vessel for the manifestation of the sacred. And I think we're going to stop right there, folks. So you get the idea. Why are all these people in positions of power in this world, why are they gigantic pervs? Well, this is exactly why. These are the things that many who belong to the high echelons of the occult fraternities believe and act upon. And of course, they get their lower level minions, you know, those people that we would call agents of government and corporation and some of the power brokers of this world. These are the things they get them involved with too, and then they blackmail them to keep them quiet and to do their bidding. This is how it works. And this is why. So when you understand, it's all about this baptism of wisdom, as they like to call it. The inversion process. The reversal of the natural order of things to become God, or to get back closer to Godhood, to revert back to that. These are the things they do. 
and they see these inversion principles as a means to get that done. This is why they do the things they do, as we see here, and we can demonstrate these different connections. Why have the Freemasons adopted the figure of John as very important to them, not just John the Evangelist, but John the Baptist? Why do they teach within the occult fraternities that the Gospel of John is referring to John the Baptist, and that's what the whole book is about, John the Baptist? Well, because it relates back to these ideas that can be traced back to the Templars and before the Templars, this connection of these archetypes together through the Templars into John the Baptist and the idea of Baphomet brought into the world through the Templars. The inversion principle, that's when the inversion process started with the Templars. Up until that point, up until that point, things may have progressed a little differently. They were not as debauched or inverted or backwards. Not as corrupt. But at that point, that's when corruption set in in this world. The introduction of this inversion principle of the natural order, this Baphomet idea. And with it came central banking. Interestingly enough, right? <laughs> so understand... What's been done here in the world? How many of these synchromystic ties undergird everything? All these occult symbological connections begin to make sense when you could trace things back and look and see what in the world are they trying to infer here? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? When you understand, when you begin to research a lot of these things, no matter what it is, whether it's government corruption or uh, you name your conspiracy, any quote-unquote conspiracy topic out there, you name your conspiracy, you always come to these two points. Two points you come to. You either find occultism and the ancient mystery schools at one end, invariably, and I wish that was not the case, but it certainly is, you always find occultism attached to all of it, any of it. And at the other end, at the future end of it, if you follow the, the timeline forward through the ideologies presented from the past and coming to pass in the current day, and follow them to their invariable end, you will always find the transhumanist notion of things. It's the fulfillment of their great work. But it's not a true great work. It's the inversion principle, you see, as we discussed previous here. It's all about inversion, and this is why, folks. This right here, the figure of Baphomet has been adopted wholesale as the symbol of this age. The new god of this age is science. It's an inversion of the natural order. That's why we see the things in, going on in the world that we see today. They think they could become God. They have the hubris to think that they could become God. That they could do so through the use of advanced technologies. That's what undergirds everything going on in the world today. It's this push for transhumanism, and it has its roots back in the ancient mystery schools. And it has a culminating turning point that can be traced back to the Templars that's coming into fruition and full manifestation right now. And we could see, when we look at this stuff, how these synchromistic ties that most people would dismiss are more important than ever. And that's why we take the time to read these things. Anyway, folks, I want to thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night now. Come with me.
See 